Say, hey, Shilla's ethers, bullshit. You know, ashwagandha might have certain compounds. A lot of people have this misconception that cortisol is bad. Testosterone boosting supplements simply cannot work. But most of these studies around Shilla Jeet and all of these testosterone boosters are simply paid and funded. You wouldn't believe me. Hey guys, my name is Satyendra Chokse and I'm back with yet another video. Now, today we are going to talk about endocrine system and how it affects homeostasis in the body. But before we move forward with this chapter, I would request you, I'd urge you guys to go and watch all of my previous chapters because if you do not understand the fundamentals, some of the things that I'm discussing in this video might be a little bit difficult for you to grasp on. All right, so let's move forward with the endocrine system. If you recall in the first chapter where we were talking about body's anatomy, we were talking about body's physiology, we talked about levels of organization, how you have a skeletal system, you have a muscle system, you have different organs, tissues, etc., etc., And all of these things are controlled with the help of the endocrine system. So that's the endocrine system that we are going to talk about. When we talk about endocrine system, we basically are talking about each and everything that's controlled in your body, like metabolism, your hunger, your thirst, your sexual drive, your sleep and wake up cycle, your blood pressure, your blood glucose, your growth and development, your sexual function, even your mood, all of this is affected or basically driven in the body with the help of your endocrine system. Now, let's try and understand the meaning of these words, endocrine. In biology, endo means inside and exo means outside, okay? Crin means secret or release. If you put these words together, endocrine means release inside. Release inside what? Release inside bloodstream. Exocrine, release outside. Release outside where? In a duct or somewhere, but not in the bloodstream. Okay, so there's basically two types of systems in the body. You have the endocrine system and you have the exocrine system. Endocrine system secrete hormones, which they directly release into your bloodstream. An exocrine system releases something which is non-hormonal. It could be tears, it could be sweat, it could be some sort of a mucus, you know, and they release it in the duct, not into the bloodstream, okay? So you have exocrine system, you have the endocrine system, okay? So there's roughly 40 odd glands in the body that are responsible for producing these hormones and other substances. So you have endocrine glands and then you have exocrine glands. We are not going to talk about exocrine glands because we are not studying exocrine system. We are primarily learning about endocrine system today. Okay, so when we talk about endocrine system, once again, you have different functions of the endocrine system. It controls your metabolism, it controls your hunger, your thirst, your homeostasis, which is your blood pressure, your blood glucose, your fluid, your thermoregulation. Then you have your electrolyte balance, body temperature, your growth and development, sexual function, reproduction, sleep, fake cycle, and your mood. All of this is controlled by the endocrine system. And like I said, there are different kinds of glands in the body. You have 40 odd glands. Some of them are endocrine. Some of those are exocrine glands. Like a typical example of an endocrine gland, and we'll cover all of them in detail, would be your pineal gland, your pancreas. You have your testis, you have your ovary. These are examples of your endocrine glands. In exocrine glands, you have your parotid gland, and then you have your, your pyloric glands, then you have your sweat glands, you have your tear ducts. All of these things would be example of exocrine glands. Let's focus back on endocrine glands. Have a look at the diagram. We are primarily talking about the hypothalamus. We're talking about the pineal gland. We are talking about the thyroid gland. Then we are going to talk about thymus, pancreas, adrenal glands, kidneys, and in males, we have testis. And in women, we have ovaries. Okay, so these are the major glands in the body. And think of hypothalamus as a control center. Now, it's very important for all of us to understand that for all the hormonal regulation, you know, all these glands, they produce hormones after they take consult from the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus is sort of like a control center in your body. Your hypothalamus is located in your brain and uh, it's, it's like a almond shaped, almond sized gland. And then you have your pineal gland, which is located near the thalamus. And then you have your pituitary gland again in your brain. And then you have the thyroid gland, you have your parathyroid gland in your um, this area. Uh, neck and then you have your pancreas which is located slightly next to your liver then you have the adrenal glands which are located on top of your kidneys then you have the kidneys and then you have the testis and ovaries in your females right so think of all of this gland system as as a, as a different uh, let's let's actually let's talk about the postal system 
you know how there's a head post office and then there are different regional post offices and what happens in the post offices is like people can exchange messages from one post office to another post office right so for example let's say i am an individual who wants to relay a message to some of my relatives like somewhere in distant location so what do i do i write down the message okay and then i post that message in a local post box and then a mailman connects collects that uh, message and then takes it to the headquarter from that region or that district from that region that district my message goes to a central district central region from there it again goes to target local post box the local post box receives the message the postman from the local post box collects the message and then delivers it to my relatives in a distant location right so think of these hormonal systems um, the endocrine system as a as a post office network where one cell basically wants to communicate something to a bunch of other cells so that they can execute a certain function or a task right so have a look at the diagram and you'd see that how hypothalamus is the is the is basically the main post office the, the head post office where all the mails all of the exchange happens in the head post office right so you have different kinds of neurotransmitters in the body like you have your glutamate you have your gaba you have um, your even atps right so all of these function as neurotransmitters very basically your um, you get a response to everything for example let's say if i'm touching a heated surface right so if i'm touching a heated surface i'm going to get a heat shock which will be registered in my brain and the neurons are going to use neurotransmitters to connect to my hypothalamus and then the hypothalamus will kind of decode that message it will say hey this this thing is hot right now this thing is super hot my hypothalamus is going to send out a signaling hormone to my pituitary gland which will again secrete uh, let's say an acth in this case which is your adrenal corticosteroids and then it will stimulate my adrenal glands to kind of secrete let's say cortisol or maybe even adrenaline which will kind of activate my fight or flight response right so anything that you do anything that you touch you feel you smell um, whether you're scared whether you're feeling cold whether you're feeling hot whether you are uh, you know experiencing palpitations whether you're experiencing high blood pressure whether you're doing exercise all of that is sort of like message to the body and these messages are then decrypted in the hypothalamus or let's say these messages are then understood in the hypothalamus the hypothalamus sends different hormones uh, your activating hormones or stimulating hormones uh, which further stimulate your pituitary gland and from pituitary gland you have all of these different glands which are connected with your pituitary gland and then they will release different kinds of hormones which will carry out different type of functions managing the homeostasis in the body right so if you remember the last episode we talked about thermoregulation in which if you sit in cold and if it's too cold your body automatically generates uh, you know it starts shivering generating heat right that's an example of thermoregulation or if you go out in the sun your body starts producing sweat and uh, electrolytes you know they come out of your sweat glands right that's also an example of thermoregulation so there's a constant feedback which is happening and this feedback is being you know collected in the hypothalamus and then passed on to different glands for taking different actions so have a look at the diagram you understand that all sorts of internal and external stimuli is collected in the hypothalamus you have different neurotransmitters which help hypothalamus is then going to activate your pituitary gland it will send the signal to your pituitary gland and then pituitary gland will then you know have these different kinds of hormones for example it will release the adh which will affect your water balance in the body right then you have vasopressin and adh they control the water in the body and then you have the oxytocin which will affect your the production of milk in women and it will also help with the contractions in the uterus during pregnancy right and then you have uh, let's say gh which will affect the growth and development of your bones and soft tissues and then you have the acth which is your adrenocorticotropic hormones which will affect your adrenal glands and cause the adrenal glands to release adrenocorticosteroids which is your cortisol cortisone you know these and then it will also affect the adrenal glands to produce your epinephrine or norepinephrine which we collectively refer to as catecholamines and then you, it will also produce tsh which is a thyroid stimulating hormone which will affect your thyroid gland leading it to produce t3 and t4 
then it will also release your FSH and LS, which is follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which will also affect your testis and ovary into producing testosterone, estrogen and progesterone. Then it will also produce prolactin, which will affect then your breast augmentation and production of milk in women. So all of this, and you see the, the red line is basically the bloodstream, right? So whenever these hormones are released, these hormones will circulate in the bloodstream and then you have two sides of your pituitary gland you have the anterior pituitary gland and you have the posterior pituitary gland so the concentration of these hormones in the bloodstream is thus going to exert force on your anterior pituitary gland and that will basically cause a negative feedback loop and then it will activate your anterior pituitary gland to release different kinds of hormones the blood concentration of these hormones will also affect your hypothalamus right so like I said, there are major glands. We have the hypothalamus, which is like the control center. You have the pituitary gland, which controls the endocrine glands, other endocrine glands. So it's the master gland, um, which releases your growth hormone, ACTH, TSH, etc. Then you have the thyroid gland, which produces your thyroid hormones, T3, T4, which regulate metabolism. Then you have your adrenal glands, which produces, you know, cortisol, cortisone, adrenaline, noradrenaline, aldosterone, and then you have your pancreas and you have your gonads, which is testis and ovaries, which produce your sex hormones like testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. And there are different kinds of hormones. Basically, the hormones can be categorized into three categories. One is your peptide-based hormones, which are derived from amino acids. A good example of this would be epinephrine, which is actually a derivative of tyrosine, which you know is an essential amino acid, derived from non-essential amino acid, feline, alanine. Right? So once you have foods which are rich in feline aline, it will get converted into tyrosine and tyrosine therefore is a precursor for uh, uh, nor, uh, norepinephrine as well as epinephrine. Right? So this is an example of a peptide hormone or amine based hormones where you have amino acids and then these hormones are made from these amino acids. Then you have steroid hormones which are made from cholesterol. So you have a testosterone, you have cortisol, you have progesterone, and we'll go through the entire list of these hormones which are made from what. And then you have the protein hormones which are which are basically made from two or more amino acids. The, the structure is protein. So you have insulin, you have um, growth hormone, these are protein hormones. Okay, so there's almost 50 different hormones in the body. Obviously we can't cover all of them, but some of the hormones are listed here and you can see all the different hormones you'd see that growth hormone is a protein hormone then you have ACTH which is a peptide hormone then you have T3 and T4 which is thyroid hormones which are both amine hormones and then you have aldosterone which is again a steroid hormone you have cortisol corticosterone cortisone all of these are steroid hormones epinephrine I have just informed you and norepinephrine these are amine hormones and then you have insulin and glucone which are both protein hormones right so you have amine hormones you have protein hormones and you have steroid hormones which are derived from cholesterol so let's talk briefly about some of these hormone functions you know let's let's cover some of the hormones that are commonly known so we already know that we have insulin insulin facilitates you know uptake of glucose in your cells and helps lowering in your blood glucose levels then you have cortisol cortisol increases your blood sugar levels in the body and suppresses the immune system when it's needed Remember, a lot of people have this misconception that cortisol is bad because it suppresses the immune system. There's two sides of it, okay? So immune system is good when it's trying to fight off inflammation, but it itself is inflammatory, which means that if you get a blood clot and your body is um, going to deposit a lot of blood cells in the area which is wounded, so your, your, your body has a response to inflammation, okay? And this response is, is, is almost like an attack. So unless until somebody mediates the attack, you will keep on having this blood clotting, right? So cortisol, it also has, you know, immune suppressing abilities, but not necessarily that's a bad thing for you. That's also a good thing for you. At times it is good. So cortisol, while it's an inflammatory hormone, it also has anti-inflammatory effects because the whole process in which the body tries to fight off itself is pretty inflammatory or can say it's pretty aggressive. Like body will want to increase the temperature you know because it just wants to kill pathogen right 
but it's not thinking that if you have too much fever for too long, yes, you're trying to kill the fever, but you're also inadvertently killing the human body, right? So there has to be some sort of a regulation mechanism. And cortisol is one of those hormones. So cortisol, while it's an inflammatory hormone, it also exerts anti-inflammatory effects in the body, okay? So very important. So when I'm saying that cortisol suppresses the immune system, please understand that it's in context. It's in a positive context, not necessarily in a negative context. Then we have adrenaline. Adrenaline is your fight and flight response. You know, it dilates your airways, your boosts energy, uh, increases focus, and sometimes even brings back, you know, dead people from Tom Cruise movies, right? Then you have thyroid hormones, T3, T4. They regulate your metabolism, growth, and development. So how do these hormones actually function? Like what exactly happens when these glands release these specific hormones, right? So remember the postal example where I'm somebody who wants to send a message to my distant relatives. Okay, so what do I do? I write down a certain message and then this message I post it in my post box. And from this post box, a mailman collects the message, takes it to the district postal office. And from the district postal office goes to the central main postal office. You have the hypothalamus for that. And then from the main postal office, it again goes to from the local post office and the mailman connects it from the local post office and delivers it to those distant relatives. Have a look at the diagram. Okay. So when we're talking about these glands, these glands also have uh, cells. For example, in case of pancreas, you have alpha cells and beta cells. You know, the two cells produce different kinds of hormones. In a similar manner, when we talk about the adrenal glands, you have adrenal cortex and you have adrenal medulla. So you have these glands also have different kinds of cells which can produce different kinds of hormones, okay? So imagine the cells producing the hormone and because we are talking about endocrine system, the glands are always going to release the hormone in the bloodstream, okay? So the glands will produce a certain hormone, the cells will secrete the hormone into the bloodstream and through the blood, the circulatory network that we have, through the blood circulatory network, it will go and reach the target cell, which is my distant relative. And on the target cell, now I will have something which we call as the hormone receptors, okay? So in the case of hormone receptors, the hormone will bind to the hormone receptors either on the surface of the cell or the inside of the cell, which we'll cover in a while. And then it will cause it to take certain action. For example, I want to send a message to my relatives asking them to send me money, money, because I don't have any money left, right? So in which case I'll write a letter, dad need money or mama, I need money urgently. I'm sending that and then it's going to the, uh, the central post uh, office from the central post office to local post office. From there, my mama, my dad, or any of my relatives receive that message, hey, JC needs money because he doesn't have money, right? So they're going to perform a certain task, which is not only are they going to reply back, they'll probably send me a money order, right? Um, hypothetically, right? So that's what happens. Your target cell, once it receives the, the hormone, and then it undergoes certain functions, carries out certain functions. The best way to understand this is the example of uh, insulin and glucose. So if you take a look at the example, you have, and before this, actually, let me just cover one thing, okay? So you have different kinds of hormones, like I said, your protein hormones, some are amine hormones and some are steroid hormones. So these steroid hormones are pretty intrusive. They don't just bind at the receptor of the cell surface, they can actually go inside the cell and bind with receptors either uh, on the cytoplasm or even inside the nucleus. On the other hand, non-steroid hormones typically just bind on the surface of the cell. So let's talk about the example now. Insulin is a non-steroid hormone. We know it's a protein hormone, so it cannot penetrate the cell. So you have cells and we are talking about how glucose uptake happens in case of cells with the help of insulin. So, and this is something which we have also covered in the last episode, discussing this again, because this is an important subject. So you have insulin receptors on the surface of the cell. What happens is your pancreas is going to release insulin, and then insulin is going to go and bind on the surface of the uh, cell uh, with the insulin receptors. Once insulin binds on the surface of the cell uh, with the insulin receptors, it is going to then send a message to the inside of cell. You have your vesicles, which contain GLUT4. Remember, GLUT4 is basically the glucose transporters which go in and out of the cell, inside the cell to surface of the cell, collect the glucose and come back, right? This is how glucose transport happens. We discussed this in the last chapter, so it should be pretty easy for you to understand. So insulin binds with the insulin receptors on the surface of the cell 
this basically carries out something what we call as cell transduction. Whenever we are talking about signaling using in, inside the cell, that's referred to as cellular transduction. It's 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 a type of messaging which happens inside cells. Okay, so insulin will bind to receptors on the surface of the cell. It will result in a signal transduction, um, and it will signal the vesicles inside the inside the cell to release blood for transporters. And these transporters will then go from uh, inside the cell to surface of the cell where you have glucose molecules waiting for them it will then trap the glucose molecules and bring them inside the cell again right so what's happening here the pancreas is releasing the insulin hormone the insulin is reaching the target cell site and then on the target cell site it is affecting the cell and what is the effect the cell is finally opening up releasing the blood flow transporters from inside the cell to outside the cell and trapping glucose molecules inside and because of this simple transduction you basically have your entire blood glucose regulation right so this is what happens in case of hormones this is how hormones function this is how hormones work and this was an example of a negative feedback loop remember we also discussed negative and positive feedback loops in the last chapter so this is an example of a negative feedback loop the concentration of the blood glucose itself affects the concentration of blood glucose if it's if it's uh, higher than the normal biological range um, you, it will signal the pancreas to release insulin insulin drive down the excess glucose into the cells if it is lower than 70 mg per dl in that case you'll have pancreas which will release glucagon and Glucagon will then signal the liver to start doing gluconeogenesis, which will further break down glycogen into blood glucose, right? So this is an example of a negative feedback loop. Let's talk about one more example of a negative feedback loop here. Let's talk about a thyroid hormone, okay? So you have the hypothalamus, which is, like I said, control center, and it is going to receive neurotransmitters or it will also uh, get some sort of a signal in the form of, let's say, the concentration of um, thyroid and uh, in the bloodstream and then it will decode that signal and it will determine hey if i need more thyroid what am i going to do so it will release the trh which is your thyroid dropping stimulating hormone and the trh will then go ahead and stimulate pituitary gland the pituitary will release tsh which is your thyroid stimulating hormone and then tsh will st stimulate the thyroid gland to produce t3 and t4 and again once the concentration of t3 and t4 arises in the bloodstream this will be detected by your pituitary gland as well as your hypothalamus and it will reduce the production of trh and tsh itself okay so this is how negative feedback loop as well as the homeostasis is maintained using these hormones so these are two examples of negative feedback loop you have the blood glucose levels um, and then you have the thyroid levels in the body right so how concentration of uh, these particular hormones uh, produced by your end glands also exert effects on your hypothalamus which can also control the further production of these hormones okay so once again you have your hypothalamus which will release your trh which will affect your pituitary gland pituitary gland will release tsh which is thyroid stimulating hormone and that will affect your um, thyroid glands to produce t3 and t4 if the concentration rises it will affect the production of tsh and trh both so now let's discuss a bit about positive feedback loops you getting fat where you're taking the body away from homeostasis is an example of a positive feedback loop similarly blood clotting where you're getting injured and you get a wound and you have your blood vesicles getting damaged so you have more blood cells getting concentration in the area causing the blood to clot right so blood clotting as well as getting fat both are examples of positive feedback loop which we have also discussed in the last session now the reason why i am talking about all of these things and somebody would ask me jc why are we discussing all of this complex biochemistry and physiology stuff like what's in it for us why do we need to discuss all of these things in so much detail well the point being unless until i clarify all of these fundamentals i can't really tell you that syllogy is actually bullshit which i'm about to prove to you but had I just told you that Shilaji is bad without explaining the underlying science of how an oral testosterone boosting supplement simply cannot work, you wouldn't believe me. But now that you know the background and now that you know the science behind how hormones function and you can't really um, increase the concentration of a hormone without understanding uh, the entire feedback loop and all the mechanism, uh, you know, you, you, you wouldn't really understand what I'm trying to say. And so... Uh, that's why it's all important and so before i get into the details of shilajit and why it's bullshit and it's not going to increase your testosterone level let's understand 
the feedback loop for your testosterone production. Okay. Now have a look at this. You have your hypothalamus once again, and hypothalamus is going to respond based on different kinds of factors. Are you out in the wild trying to survive? Are you, you know, somebody who has to produce more kids? Are you someone who's, you know, trying to fight a battle? Or are you somebody who's like a lazy bum sitting at your home, not doing much, eating crap, and have a pretty shitty lifestyle? Basis this, your hypothalamus is going to determine if you really need more testosterone in your body, right? Because testosterone is not just your reproductive hormone. It's a, it's a, it's a primal hormone. It's, it's a hormone which is, which is what makes you a man. And when you talk about being a man-man, men are supposed to be ferocious, they're supposed to be hunters, they're supposed to be wild, right? So it gives you the rage, it gives you the passion, it gives you the instincts, the killer instincts, all of that comes from testosterone. So hypothalamus is not going to release testosterone just because you want testosterone, right? It will detect all the changes in your body, it will detect your lifestyle, and basis that, it will determine if you need more testosterone in the body, right? So it's a, it's a primal hormone. So hypothalamus is going to detect internal and external cues and then release uh, what we call as GnRH or gonadotropin release hormone, which will again signal pituitary gland and pituitary gland is going to release FSH and LH. So you have your uh, luteinizing hormone and you have follicle stimulating hormone. And these hormones will further trigger your testes to produce testosterone. Okay, and if you have too much testosterone, it will then affect the pituitary gland because remember the bloodstream concentration of testosterone is going to exert effects back on pituitary as well as hypothalamus, right? So it will affect, exert effect and thereby limiting the production of FSH and LH and therefore it will also affect the production of GnRH, right? So there's an entire feedback loop. So your testosterone levels are going to maintain a very strict biological range depending on how much testosterone hypothalamus thinks you need in your body, not what you want, okay? Now, let's talk about Shilajit because it's often touted as one of those supplements that can increase your testosterone levels. We know that testosterone is a derivative of cholesterol. So clearly, cholesterol is made by each and every single cell in your body. Bulk of cholesterol is made from the dietary fats that we consume. Even if you don't have dietary fats, your body can still make its own cholesterol, right? So there's no rate limiting factor, there's no missing element that you probably need for the production of testosterone. Now, some might argue that, hey, DHEA is precursor to testosterone, fine, that's fine. But I'm saying your body has all the raw material it needs to create testosterone. And so the only thing that can affect the testosterone production is if there's some sort of a deficiency, let's say somebody is not consuming enough vitamin D, somebody who is not consuming enough of zinc, which could be coenzymes, which could be cofactors, which can affect the production of testosterone. But having said that, if all of those conditions are met, somebody is not deficient in calcium, vitamin D or zinc uh, or magnesium or somebody sleeping enough and there's no deficiency, in that case, the only thing that can actually determine how much testosterone is going to be in your body is your hypothalamus. And hypothalamus takes your internal as well as external cues into account and then increases or decreases the production of testosterone in your body. Now, testosterone is made from cholesterol. What possibly can Shilajit offer you that can increase the production of testosterone? Because testosterone is a hormone and unless until you artificially inject testosterone, there is nothing that can actually replace or increase the quantity of actual testosterone in your body. So except artificial testosterone, there is no substance, there is no compound that you can consume orally which will affect the concentration of testosterone in your body. So that's why when I say, hey, Shilajit is bullshit, that's, that's why I say that. Because if you don't understand how feedback loops work in your body, how all of these things are regulated by your endocrine system, by your hypothalamus, you'd fall for any sort of bullshit. So not just testosterone. You have claims of people telling, hey, take this drug, this is going to reduce cortisol levels. For example, ashwagandha, you know, ashwagandha might have certain compounds which can maybe bind with the hormone receptors on the surface of the cell, thereby inhibiting the production of cortisol. So inhibiting the production of a certain hormone is still possible, but you are talking about increasing the concentration of the hormone itself, which directly is simply not possible. And so most of these studies around Shilajit and Tonka Deli and all of these testosterone boosters and how they affect your testosterone levels in the body are simply paid and funded. And there's no data, no evidence. And you can see there's no possible physiological mechanisms exist that can increase the amount of these hormones in the body, right? So next time when you see an ad of 
Shilajit and how it boosts testosterone levels in the body. Understand the HPTA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary and testis axis. Okay. Having said this, I think uh, endocrine system chapter comes to an end. We have a few more concepts which we need to discuss in detail. How all of this and again building from here, how all of this affects your biochemistry. For example, when you train hard or when you are exposed to, let's say, uh, chronic stress versus if you are exposed to, let's say, an acute stress, which is like short term stress, what kind of physiological adaptations happen in your body? Uh, this is one chapter that I want to cover next. Maybe after this, the things will become far more simpler and I won't have to explain everything in detail. I'll simply say, hey, Shilaj eat this bullshit because of the HPT and you'd understand what I'm talking about, right? Or in a similar manner, I'll tell you, hey, don't do too much of cardio because it is going to lead to cellular efficiency you would understand from chapter first what he means by cellular efficiency basically more atps are being produced from less amount of food right that's what cellular efficiency is i think after the fundamentals are clear i think we'll have we, we would have reached a place where i would explain you something and you'd be like yeah that makes sense right but i wanted to cover all of this before we go into nutrition and training and hopefully you'll be able to understand why and uh, with that chip uh, this chapter comes to an end i hope you learned something new and uh, i'll see you again next week we'll talk about physiological adaptations in the body in response to chronic as well as acute stress and how these hormones affect all of those things take care